Good afternoon and welcome to our broadcast. Thank you so much for joining us today to learn more about community benefit in Northern California. My name is Debbie Gibson and I have the pleasure to lead operations for our integrated community investments at Providence. With me today is Victor Jordan, the Regional Chief Executive for Northern California and Dana Codron, our Regional Director for Northern California Community Health Investment. With the release of our system-wide 2020 annual report to the community just this past May, I'm hoping that many of you saw both the financial results for community benefit and also the amazing collage of stories that highlights our different programs, initiatives, and investments that we made last year to serve individuals and communities in proactive and strategic ways that address unmet and critical community health needs. We know, however, that this is more than just a typical report because it really is about our goal of more broadly as a health system to create health for a better world. And it's also about the very vocalized work that we do to make a difference in individuals' lives and impacting communities in incremental but significant ways. The end report to our community demonstrates this work in a very unique way, which allows us to really connect these community initiatives to our strong mission and heritage, as well as the social determinants of health, and demonstrates how this work extends beyond the walls of our hospitals and can also play an important role in improving patient outcomes as well as overall health and well being. So, today we're going to focus in on some of these details about the Northern California region with both Victor and Dana here with us and the work that's going on in their specific communities. So, Victor, I'll start with you and ask you to first tell us a little bit about yourself, what brought you to your leadership position at Providence in Northern California, and maybe a little brief overview of the different markets that make up your region. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm Victor Jordan. I am the Regional Chief Executive for Northern California on an interim basis. Happy to be up here. Been serving in this role about two months now and have already learned a lot about what we're doing with community benefits and really am pleased that we're getting the word out today to our communities about the great work we do. For the past four years, I've been the Regional Chief Operating Officer for Providence down in Southern California. And I live down there in Orange County with my wife and I have two kids a little bit older, uh, one in college and one in Miami who's 23. So I have many years of healthcare uh, leadership experience at the regional level and hospital level. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the regional overview up here in Northern California and what I've learned so far in our three distinct markets. We provide services in Humboldt County through Redwood Memorial Hospital and St. Joseph Hospital Eureka. St. Joseph Hospital is an acute care hospital founded in 1920, so they just celebrated their 100th anniversary of being a hospital up in Eureka. The service area for us is the entire Humboldt County, everybody up there in every part of the county, including more than 100,000 people. In Humboldt County, we offer a variety of community-based programs that meet the needs of vulnerable populations, and our focus in this area is equitable access to healthcare for everyone that lives there. Primary care, health promotion, and community building are all very important in Humboldt County. Moving to Napa County, we provide services through Queen of the Valley Medical Center. QVMC is an acute care hospital founded in 1958 and located in Napa, California. The hospital service area is the entire county of Napa. It's approximately 140,000 people. We dedicate resources in this community with a special emphasis on the poor and vulnerable, and this meets our mission at Providence. And then finally, going down to Sonoma County, Santa Rosa Memorial Hospital, Petaluma Valley Hospital, and Healdsburg Hospital are part of our countywide network encompassing Sonoma County. Providence also has urgent care facilities, hospice, home health, and other facilities for treating the healthcare needs of the community in Sonoma County. We are moving toward a health delivery system versus being a hospital company and really being more holistic about what we do out in the communities. I'd also like to mention the great physician network that we have in all three of these counties through our Providence Medical Foundation and also through the great medical staffs that we have at each hospital taking care of our patients. So that's the overview of the market. Great, thank you, Victor. So um, I'll ask Dana to do the same. Dana, can you please give us um, a little bit about uh, background about yourself 
uh, as well as how you're organized in the Northern California region to really uh, support this community health investment work. Um, and also perhaps high level, what were your big takeaways from 2020 uh, in terms of community needs and the challenges as a result of the pandemic? Sure, Debbie, thank you. Um, began my healthcare career as a nurse more than 35 years ago. Um, it was definitely a calling for me. I, I knew as a young girl that I wanted to be a nurse. And about midway through my career, I moved from taking care of patients in the hospital to home health where I would meet patients in their homes. And it was there that I discovered my passion for community health. I could see really firsthand how certain socioeconomic conditions interfered with someone's ability to live a healthy uh, and high, healthy life and a high quality life. Um, for example, if someone is concerned about keeping a roof over their head or food in the refrigerator, um, they were less likely to be able to prioritize co-pays for doctor's visits or uh, to purchase prescriptions. So then we see this ripple effect in terms of poor health outcomes. And so I went back to school to get my master's degree in public health. And here I am so very uh, proud to be a leader and a caregiver for community health uh, for Providence here in Northern California. Yes, in terms of our um, how we're organized in our region to support community health. There are multiple ways that we contribute to our communities. One, of course, is through cash uh, contributions or donations. Another way that we also provide here in Northern California is by providing direct services, such as a mobile dental clinic or a mobile health clinic. Um, we have our footprint in elementary schools and in um, high needs areas providing health outreach and education. So uh, uh, across our region, we have approximately 120 community health caregivers for us uh, in Northern California. And that they really range from uh, dentists to nurse practitioners, nurses, social workers, community health workers, health educators, just to name a few. And yes, that definitely the kinds of investments that we made in 2020 uh, changed in a strategic way as a result of the pandemic. One example is that um, we decreased our traditional um, cash donations and sponsorships in order to increase grants and uh, dollars that focused on COVID response and emergent needs. Um, we really looked at um, increasing equitable access to care, especially with regard to COVID testing, treatment, and outreach. Um, also addressing significant spikes in food insecurity brought on by the, the very high unemployment rate and economic impacts of the pandemic. And we addressed critical needs uh, among the unstably housed, in particular providing PPE, assisting people to become temporarily housed and to quarantine safely. We did need to change our response given the pandemic uh, last year in those ways. But in general, aside from the pandemic, our work is driven by priorities that come from a very robust community health needs assessment. When we conduct a community health needs assessment every three years, and then based on those priorities that um, are indicated by the needs assessment, that really informs how and, and how strategically and where we'll invest our dollars and resources into the communities we serve. Our last Last needs assessment was just conducted and in across our region, we have four priority areas that we'll be focusing our, our energies on uh, and resources on. One is mental health and substance use. Another is homelessness and housing instability. And then another one is access to health services. And we saw during the pandemic that not everyone has equal access to health services. And then the fourth one is uh, really calling out health equity as a priority for us to address. And that is encompassing racism, discrimination, LGBTQ needs, uh, anything that has to do with um, equitable access to care and services and quality of life. Thank you both, Victor and Dana, for that background. Uh, listening to you talk, uh, Dana, all of these needs seem um, pretty significant given the issues in 2020, not just from COVID, but also from the social unrest that we experienced, um, as well as the wildfires that, uh, you know, really uh, were prominent for us, especially here in the West. So, uh, Victor, I guess the next question I'll ask of you, uh, given all of these significant needs and the information that Dana just shared, um, what can you tell us specifically about the Northern California region's financial commitment to community benefit? And how did it compare to the year before that? 
Well, I can tell you that Dana and the team have educated me well on what we've been doing up here. So I'd be happy to share uh, some of this information. The total community benefit spend in 2020 was approximately $112 million, which is significant. The investment represents 10 million more than last year than in 2019. And I think that's significant too because of the critical community needs brought on by COVID-19, as well as the financial challenges within our own health system caused by COVID-19. Part of this community benefit includes charity care and uncompensated Medicaid, or what we call Medi-Cal in California. And that is for that program for Medi-Cal, the cost of providing care to these patients actually exceeds the reimbursement that we receive from the government. And so that is part of the community benefit too um, when we provide those services. Then we have proactive investments where we get out ahead of the curve and those total $29 million last year. It includes different categories such as grants, donations, community building initiatives, community health programs, subsidized health services, health professionals, education, and research. Providence sets an internal target for this financial commitment as part of our overall system plan each year. We have set targets for all of our regions and at the system level based on spending a certain percentage of our net revenue. And when I say net service revenue, that means the amount of money we expect to collect in total for all of the services we provide to the patients we reinvest part of that back into our community benefits at a certain percentage. We monitor the progress regularly within our regional leadership team and our local community boards. So community benefit is part of a formal roadmap to achieving our vision of health for a better world. And that is our vision within Providence, health for a better world. And it clearly reflects our collective commitment to address the inequities that Dana mentioned earlier, health inequities, and disparities in healthcare, as well as the social determinants of health. These are the kind of investments that are needed to level the playing field for those that don't have as much resources as some others. And then also finally, community benefit is a form of public trust that our communities need to have in us because of our nonprofit tax status. Thank you, Victor. You mentioned uh, uh, several times we've talked about proactive investments, and that that certainly is a significant financial commitment that you uh, that you just discussed. But can you talk to us a little bit more about what does proactive really mean? Why do we focus on it, and and how does that translate into the investments uh, that we make and the programs that we create for the community? Sure. Um, you know, thinking about proactive investments, as I mentioned earlier, getting ahead of the curve and not being so reactive. And so those are the actions we can take to help our community get and stay healthy before they would need to otherwise seek treatment in our hospitals, especially in the emergency department. By the time you get to the emergency department, things are probably pretty bad if you haven't had access to primary care or other preventive services. One example of this is the mobile health van that we have. I had the opportunity to go up there and, and visit it uh, just last week uh, down in Petaluma. And it's, it's more than a health van. It's more like an RV. It's a very large RV. It's a rolling uh, physician's office, basically. There's a medical assistant in there and a nurse practitioner. And they drive this thing around to homeless shelters and churches. And those are the kind of proactive uh, services I'm talking about where they do health screenings and take care of folks before things get too serious and they have to go to the emergency department. Another common term is to focus on upstream interventions, uh, which means creating ways to transform a person's quality of life so that their health outcomes are improved as well. Health education and outreach about chronic conditions, wellness and exercise programs, housing solutions, and community-based mental health and substance use programs are all good examples of proactive investments. How do we connect these concepts to the investments? Dana talked earlier about our community health needs assessments or what we call CHNA. That's where we go out and we do an assessment of the community to identify what are their top health needs and critical access issues. Then we create an integrated community health improvement plan with prioritized proactive initiatives so that our investment strategies and our funds are targeting those identified needs. Also, there are hospital-based programs that are considered proactive community benefit. 
subsidized health services, which are basically clinical programs, even when they operate at a financial loss. These programs are very key to our communities. If we did not provide them in our Providence Ministries, I'm not sure who would, uh, to tell you the truth. It's part of our mission. In Northern California, Dana and her team have been working closely with our finance partners in the past year or so to be sure we are capturing and reporting all these opportunities when we report out on community benefits. So in contrast to the proactive things that I just mentioned, um, charity care and other government subsidized programs are what we call reactive. So we're taking care of these folks when they come into our hospitals, but it's not in, it's more reactive to what they're experiencing versus proactive and going out into the community. It's still considered a community benefit because it's a safety net for the uninsured and the underinsured individuals when they do seek or need treatment in our facilities. Great, thank you, Victor. So now uh, we know about your financial commitment and we know a lot more about what the proactive investments mean. I'm gonna turn it over to Dana and ask her to share some, a little bit more about some of the specific regional community health investment programs uh, to highlight and demonstrate for all of you listening, how we really bring this work to life in our communities. Absolutely. Thank you again, uh, Debbie. The, the um, programs and investments that we make in our communities do vary community to community because each community has different needs and assets. So I will share with you some of our larger uh, programs, understanding that this is not uh, inclusive. There are, are quite a few activities and, and ways that we work with and in our communities uh, through community health investment. Uh, I first will start with just uh, in general our COVID response because um, meeting the needs of the communities is what we do in community health investment. We were very fortunate in our region to have such a wide cadre of caregivers that are really um, already in the community, boots on the ground, and could pivot on a dime to respond to the pandemic, and that's exactly what we did. We had... Um, we had nurses and social workers and nurse practitioners that were able to support county public health efforts by conducting COVID testing, by um, providing outreach and education. So many of our caregivers are bilingual, uh, English, Spanish. Uh, we have a large um, uh, community of, of, of farm workers and agricultural workers and hospitality workers in Northern California. And it's very important for us to, to ensure you know, equitable access and education for everyone. So we were able to do that and support um, the, the county public health needs and also our federally qualified health centers. Um, human resources were probably um, one of the most scarce resources uh, that we had during the pandemic, both inside the hospital walls and in the community. So this was very, very valuable that we were able to do that. We also, at the very beginning of the pandemic, simply just worked with our community partners and assembled and purchased items for COVID, COVID kits, we called them, thermometers, um, PPE, masks, sanitizing uh, supplies, and um, made sure that they were distributed in high need areas. So at um, uh, farm worker uh, housing sites and agricultural sites and other areas where we had essential workers that, um, would have difficulty um, isolating and, and needed that extra help. Um, I would also um, speak to the food distribution that we did in Eureka, in Humboldt County, we have five community resource centers that we operate um, and staff. And uh, those simply turned into food distribution sites and PPE distribution sites. We also ended up, when testing was available, testing people there. So they were a trusted place in the community for people to go for help when they needed help. And we just flipped the switch and, and responded to COVID at all of those sites up in Humboldt County. Uh, I'll share also um, that um, we're fortunate in Providence that the funding for some of these initiatives, for some of these um, resources that we needed during the pandemic uh, did come from community health investment, but it also came from our St. Joseph Community Partnership Fund, which um, provides some funding support for our communities in times of um, need and natural disasters and pandemics. And also from Providence Health Equity Initiative, which is a large initiative across our system. And with those dollars, we were able to buy iPads that we could use at um, vaccination sites and in the community. 
We had bilingual community health workers that were assisting people to sign up in My Turn, which is the platform California used to get vaccinated. So uh, lots of resources pooling into our communities from, from Providence. And um, so from COVID response, because we've talked a lot about COVID, uh, we just have such a long history of providing services in our community. And this one program in particular I'll share about is called the Care Network. Um, and I believe Victor might have a story, a Care Network client story he'll share in a bit. Uh, but this program is such a good example of how we uh, are living our mission and um, the her heritage of our founding sisters. As this program has been in existence for well over 20 years, it started in Napa and is scaling across our region. And we provide services directly in the community to the most vulnerable people um, that, that we see, that we uh, um, need to care for. Um, and it's absolutely without any cost or out-of-pocket expense to our clients. This is part of our community benefit. It's part of our giving back to our community. The Care Network uh, uses a team approach. The model consists of a nurse, a social worker, and a community health worker. So those three people are one team. And we have many teams in each of our service areas. And those teams then um, have a caseload of clients or patients that they serve. These are people who have multiple complex medical conditions, but also are considered um, underinsured or uninsured, um, have really complex socioeconomic conditions, including mental health issues and substance use, addiction, and even um, homelessness. And uh, we meet people where they are in the community, whether it's a home visit or whether it's in a shelter or an encampment. Um, and we provide services. And we provide services for months for each individual because it takes months to help people get into stable housing, to help people get enrolled in health insurance, to get um, enrolled in um, uh, resources such as food, um, access, and uh, uh, linking people with warm handoffs to uh, multiple services. It does take months. And we know from what I said earlier that until our basic needs are, are stabilized, it's really hard to manage a chronic health condition. It's just not up there on the priority list. So it takes a, it takes a while. We help people get stable um, it, with their basic needs and then we um, can be make a little more progress with their health needs and really change that trajectory um, of uh, improving health and quality of life. So we serve thousands of people through Care Network, and again, uh, it is a gift to the to the community, and it's an extension of our mission and values and heritage. Um, I want to be cognizant of time here. Shall I share uh, one other uh, quick uh, uh, update um, on housing? We have invested in Northern California over the past 10 years um, close to $10 million on housing by way of um, either permanent supportive housing or shelters or recuperative care or also housing that is affordable. Um, an example of that is in Eureka where we purchased the Humboldt Inn and it is going to become the uh, Providence Mother Burnett House and provide um, supportive housing and recuperative care uh, for, um, for multiple people in that community, a very much needed resource. Debbie, I just want to check with you on time and I, I could continue or we could going. That's great, Dana. Thank you for the uh, the amazing and impactful programs uh, that you described that you and your team oversee. These examples uh, certainly uh, show to me the strong, strong theme and connection uh, that we have to community and collaboration. So to take us back a little bit in history, we know that the Sisters of St. Joseph were a congregation of women founded in about uh, 1650 in France. And the sisters eventually made their way to California from Illinois in about 1912 on the invitation of the Bishop of Sacramento to begin a new foundation and start a Catholic school in Eureka, California. So that essentially created the start of the Northern California region that has evolved to the Providence hospitals and all of the services that exist today. So based on this information, you alluded to the fact that, that Victor has a story to share. Um, Victor, when you think about the Sisters of St. Joseph and the Sisters of uh, Providence and their dedication to community and collaboration, what similarities can you draw between the work of the sisters back then and the work being done now by Providence and Community Health Investment in Northern California? Sure. I, I think if you look at the work that the sisters did, it was all about reaching out into the communities and going out and taking care of the needs of the communities wherever they were. And that was their mission. And that's what they did. And 
this topic we're talking about today with community health investment and community benefits is really in that great tradition of reaching out into our communities, identifying the needs, and then helping uh, where we can. Thank you, Victor. Did you have a specific story about the care network uh, that you wanted that you wanted to share with us as an example? I do. I do. I have a, a very good story about caring for our dear neighbor, and uh, we will just call this person Jose. Uh, but this is a true story. Uh, we've just changed the name. So caring for our dear neighbor, particularly the poor and vulnerable, is core to the history and heritage of our founding sisters, as I just mentioned. One example of going to great lengths to impact the quality of life is the story of Jose, a 67-year-old Latino man who, after a significant accident, left him in a skilled nursing facility in a neighboring county for over two years. He left the facility, returned to his hometown of Napa, however, without any money, belongings, or housing. Our care network team received a referral to see him from the county homeless shelter. The nurse and social worker made a visit and learned that in addition to his complex social needs, he also had significant medical diagnoses, including unmanaged diabetes and blindness, which was partly caused by his diabetes and partly due to a retinal detachment in both eyes. He was in desperate need of medical care. However, his Medicaid insurance was established in a different county. In addition to addressing Jose's basic needs, including clothing, food, and shelter, for this medically fragile man, the care network team needed to get his Medicaid transferred to Napa County. The problem was that after his accident and over two years in a nursing home, Jose had no physical form of identification, no knowledge of his social security number and was legally not identifiable. So just imagine being in that kind of situation. The care network social worker contacted Congressman Mike Thompson's office and worked diligently to legally verify Jose's identity, obtaining his physical ID in less than two months, all the while ensuring he had access to health care and basic needs. Obtaining this ID allowed for more medical care to be established and for the care network team to open the client to additional services. He now qualified for home health. He met with a vascular surgeon, optometrist, ophthalmologist, and received second opinions at UC San Francisco. With a history of trauma, Jose was skeptical of the diagnoses he was receiving. But after time and with the trusting relationship he had with his care network team, he agreed to the medical treatment plan for his doctor and surgeon. On June 23rd, Jose moved into permanent housing through Napa County's Project Home Key. He had no income but qualified for Project Home Key because Providence Care Network agreed to sponsor his utility bills. Now permanently housed, Jose qualifies and was approved for caregiver services. In addition, he will now receive assistance and training from the Earl Baum Center for the Blind to gain independent living skills and job training. This training and assistance was not available to him when he was not permanently housed. And I just sit here reading the story again and just awed by what this team does out in the community with these individuals that need care. So this example of how Providence cares for our most vulnerable with expertise, tenacity and advocacy is deeply rooted in our healthcare culture and our ministry. Our care network is fully funded through our community benefit program with no expense to those we serve. Jose is scheduled for surgery in July to address his attached, detached retina and is on a completely different life trajectory, improved quality of life with the support and expertise of the Providence Care Network. So that's just one example of the work that Dana and the team do. Victor, thank you for sharing about Jose. I love hearing about these stories because it always reinforces for me that we really are doing the right work at the right time. Uh, and it always makes me so proud to serve in an organization that prioritizes caring, prioritizes caring for our communities, um, particularly the poor and the vulnerable in a way that demonstrates, always demonstrates our values of compassion, dignity, justice, excellence, and integrity. So I think uh, as we close out our time together today, I would ask the both of you one final uh, quick question, and that is, 
now that we are well uh, uh, underway in 2021, what are your uh, what are your visions and hopes for the post-pandemic uh, community health in Northern California? Dana, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, as I was thinking about this question, um, the first thing that came to my mind was um, how um, the pandemic has allowed the concept of health inequities to be um, identified by by the general population and, and not just the public health world. We've known for years there's health inequities and, and disparities. Um, but now it was in front of the world's eyes. The data showed um, the high uh, COVID rates, the high death rates uh, in our uh, uh, populations of people of color and those people who have socioeconomic um, um, issue problems. I, I feel like it's there, we can't ignore it. And I'm hoping that um, my hope and, and vision is that we can work toward a system where we don't have health inequities, where everybody has equal access to quality health care. Absolutely. Thank you, Dana. How about you, Victor? What's your What are your hopes and aspirations for this year looking forward? Well, I mean, addressing health inequities was one of them that Dana just mentioned. I think also working on greater access to primary care for our communities. There's a real need for more primary care. And then more outlets for care as an alternative to overuse of the hospital's emergency departments, uh, especially in the area of mental health uh, for folks. So we really need to work on addressing some of these things so that care is given at the right time uh, and the right place. And then always, you know, living our mission. Wonderful. Well, thank you both uh, to Dana and Victor from North, uh, Providence, Northern California for talking with me today and to everyone listening and uh, sending in your questions. If you're looking to learn uh, more about community benefit and our programs in Northern California or throughout Providence uh, on our annual report, please visit www.providence.org backslash about backslash annual report. And please uh, be sure to follow us, uh, follow Providence on social media, on Twitter under the Providence Health System uh, tag on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.